So, as Helen's story reminds us, love a life, help a life, touch a life, and it can change for the better. In the New Testament, Jesus reminds us that as his followers, that's our purpose. Make a difference in someone's life just as he has made a difference in ours. One day Jesus went up on the mountain. When he sat down, his disciples came to him. Jesus started talking and teaching them many things, and he gave them instructions concerning the nature of life in his kingdom. He ended with two piercing metaphors on salt and light to illustrate the impact that disciples will have on the world around them. He said this to them, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hot hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and give, it gives light to all in the house. So he gave those two metaphors. We're just going to focus on the word salt today. Jesus, not much older than 30 at the time, spoke with his disciples. Most of them were probably his age, maybe a little younger, yet to make their mark in business, not yet established a sphere of influence, not political leaders, not born of nobility, ordinarily ordinary. And some were fishermen, Probably others probably farmers. One was a tax collector. None of them was particularly religious, and yet to those mostly uneducated men, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. And his you was emphatic. Now, in saying, you are the salt of the earth, Jesus is paying a supreme compliment. Why? Because salt was one of the most prized commodities in the first century, Roman soldiers were paid part of their salary in salt. And if a Roman soldier didn't do his job, didn't do a good day's job, he wouldn't get all of his salt. And that's where we get the phrase, he's not worth his salt. And an interesting footnote is that the word salary is derived from the word salt, it's the derivative of the Latin word for salt. People wanting to buy something in the ancient world would pay it with salt in the same way we use money today. So people would treasure salt then as we might value gold and silver today. Even today, if you refer to someone as the salt of the earth, you have saluted that person's solid worth and usefulness. When you say to someone, you are the salt of the earth, you're saying that they are good, moral, stable, dependable, solid. Solid worth and usefulness is saluted when one is called salt of the earth. And that's what Jesus said to his disciples, and he says it to us today, you are the salt of the earth. Jesus used the memorable image of salt to communicate our purpose in life. Salt changes things. Take an ordinary bland dish, add salt, and you've got something completely different. Take a life, make it different. That's what Jesus is saying. What does salt do? Irritates, it preserves, seasons, flavors creates thirst. I said first it irritates. Just over a week ago, I was in Aruba, had a small cut on my foot, decided to walk barefoot along the edge of the sea, thinking the salt water might help. Stung, but that's what salt does. Irritates. But my foot did heal quickly. Kathy Lee Gifford a former co-host of the television show, uh, Regis and Kathy Lee's show, they had a guest on the show, 
a star from the crime drama NYPD Blue. And when introducing this segment, Kathy Lee Gifford was reading from her script and noted that this was the first network TV show to feature profanity and partial nudity. I mean, as I say, that was part of her script. But suddenly she stopped reading from that script and she said, but I certainly don't think we ought to be proud of a show with profanity and partial nudity. And the guest star was so offended that he walked off the set. But Kathy Lee got thousands of affirming letters because she had the courage of, her, of standing up for her convictions. And my point just is that salty Christians might irritate. They might irritate and they might disturb the status quo because they speak up for standards and morality and righteousness. Salt irritates, but it can make a difference. Salt also preserves. In the days before refrigeration, salt was used to preserve food. I mean, after catching fish in the Lake of Galilee, the fishermen would sell their fish in Jerusalem, which was many miles south, and transportation was slow, refrigeration was non-existent, so they would salt down the catch. And when a farmer killed a cow, he'd salt the meat, the only method of preservation. If they didn't preserve it, it would rot, go bad, and it would have to be thrown out. If we don't preserve the Christian truths, what happens to the world we live in? What happens to the lives of those who are struggling? When Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, he wants us to do what we can to keep the good in this world we're living in right now. And if not, we become like the salt Jesus talks about as being worthless. No longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under f people's feet. And that sounds harsh. But what good, good are we to Jesus if we choose not to be the salt of the earth? if we choose not to come in contact with society, be distinct and maintain God's standards. In ancient days, when rains came down, pounded on their mound of salt, often the true salt, the sodium chloride, would be washed away and a useless white sandy substance was left. And farmers couldn't even throw it out on the fields because it had a hardening effect on the soil. Instead, they'd throw it out in front of the house when they wanted a hard path to walk on. If salt loses its distinctiveness, it's worthless. And the same is true of us as citizens of God's kingdom. If we lose our unique Christian qualities, our saltiness, and become like society, we've got no impact, and things go bad, or worse than they could. Jesus didn't call us to be sugar. He called us to be salt. Salt seasons, <clears throat> brings flavor. Homegrown tomato is good, but with a little salt, it's exceptional. Salt changes things, makes them better. And I think of Helen's story. Her life has changed for the better because salt was poured out upon her. Some hope, love, value was put into her life. Tangible things eased the load for her and lessened the stress and just helped make life more manageable. Salt can change the standard of life, outlook on life can make it better. And that's what Jesus has done for us. And it's our turn to do it for others. Salt also creates thirst. And you've heard the saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. True. But you can feed him some salt and help the process along. <clears throat> 
I mean, why do you think they sell <clears throat> peanuts and popcorn at the movies and the ball games? So you'll buy more drinks, right? Salt makes people thirsty. And salt can make people thirst for God, too. Which is why I asked Helen that question today, whether or not her experience has drawn her to God in any way. When people experience the good that God intends, they often start to think that perhaps there is a God who cares about them. And that's our purpose. We don't want to keep the goodness of God to ourselves. We want everyone to know him. And we want everyone to know how much he cares about them. In the lobby, <clears throat> sorry about my throat this morning. In the lobby of the resort that we stayed at in Aruba, there was a woman who was cleaning but singing at the same time. And she was singing hallelujah and hosanna. And whether or not she knew it, she was passing the salt. <clears throat> and I say that because... Her songs and her joy made me literally stop in my tracks for a moment and just think about God. That's what passing the salt can do. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. He didn't say you will become the salt of the earth or you're capable of being the salt of the earth. The emphatic tense used in the Greek text says, you are. And this was a lesson a certain father hoped to teach his son. The father said to his son, put this salt in water, come back to me in the morning. He did, and next day dad said, please bring me the salt that you put in the water yesterday. And he said, I can't find it, it's dissolved. And the wise father said to his son, well, taste the water from this side of the dish. He did, and dad said, what does it taste like? Salt. Now taste from the middle. Tell me what it tastes like. Salt. Taste it from the other side of the dish. What does it taste like? Salt. And next the father told his son to pour the salty water on the ground, did so only to discover that after the water had evaporated, the salt reappeared. Once for the salt of the earth, there's no turning back. We are the salt of the earth. And he wants us to give that special quality that makes life worth living. So where you are right now, you're there for a reason. Take your location seriously and make the most of it. And be salt right where you are. Because every corner, every life is to be seasoned by salt. Now, one more thing. In the Bible, becoming salt is not always good. You might remember Lot's wife who turned and looked back when instructed otherwise, and she turned into a pillar of salt, a pillar meaning she was stopped, never to move again. And what kind of saltiness does Je Jesus envision when he talked about his followers being the salt? Well, not something that was Im immovable for sure. There's no way. He wants something that is movable. And what might have been a new image to those disciples that he talked to that day is something that is found on our dining room table every day. A movable pillar of salt. A salt shaker, an accessible at hand delivery system of salt. And that's what Jesus calls us to be. Salt shakers, accessible, available, always at hand when reached for able to move towards wherever the salty tang of God's kingdom is needed. I'm going to ask the band to come forward now because we're going to sing a song that's just going to help us say to Jesus this morning that we want to join him on this journey into the world to bring salty goodness of the gospel with us to everyone we meet. Let's use the words of this song, I will follow you, to tell him that we're eager and happy to join him in this particular journey. 
and just remain seated as we sing. I'll stay when you move, I'll move. I will follow you. And all your ways are good, all your ways are sure, and I will trust in you alone. Higher than my sight, high above my life. I will trust in you alone. Where you go, I go. Where you stay, I stay. When you move, I move. I will follow you. Who you love, I love. How you serve, I serve. In this life, I lose. I will follow you. to be followers of you and we know that you expect certain things of us and want us to give life that special quality that you have given us and we just pray that we will take hold of the vision that you have and do all we can to shape your world according to your purposes so be with us in all of this as we try to honor and live up to all that you call us to do we continue to to celebrate all that happens within our church, all the different ministries, the way in which lives are affected, changed, and made different. And we ask that you continue to bless everything that takes place here on Friday nights. Bless what each and everyone here does in their own corner, in their own place on earth, because there are so many opportunities, so many times when we can all pass the salt. So be with us as we continue to take hold of your vision and your purpose for our lives. This is our prayer. Amen. Amen.
Before we sing our last song, I just want to say that it was during the early days of television. A workman was placing television transmitters at the top of the Empire State Building in New York City. And seeing him up at work there, so far off the ground, a reporter thought, well, this is going to make a fascinating human interest story. And so when the workman completed his task, returned to the ground, the reporter approached him and said, aren't you frightened to work under conditions like that? Isn't it dangerous to be so high off the ground? And the workman said, yes, it's dangerous. But then he added, but then how many people could say they have changed the skyline of a city like New York? God offers us the privilege of changing the skyline, not of a city, but of a world. And we can make this world more healthy, more humane, more harmonious. God made a good world, and he wants us to make it good again, and we can. By God's grace, we can and we will. And it's expressed in this next song that we're going to stand and sing. Greater things are yet to come. Amen. Greater things are still to be done Amen. in this city and beyond. Amen. Let's sing.